Hey now, everybody! Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Star Wars Time Show. And boy, oh boy, are we excited. And hopefully you can see why if you are on the live stream. That's right, boys and girls, we are joined by some Star Wars prequels royalty in the form of <laughs> Mr. Silas Carson, a.k.a. Kiati Mundi, a.k.a. Newt Gunray, a.k.a. Antidar Williams, and one more for good measure, a.k.a aka lot dodd at least as the 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 person wow. in the costume right mr carson did i get them all you got them all man i was just thinking how greedy i am when i listen to that <laughs> you really I, I when we were doing our research I did, all, I did all of that you sure did you sure did i mean how did they uh how did they it was George on drugs or something when that happened? <laughs> Potentially. <laughs> well, ho hopefully you'll let us know as we get into the interview. Does Did George <laughs> Lucas uh, maybe smoke something back in the 90s? Who knows? But uh, I, again, I just want to thank you for- I couldn't possibly come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we won't go there then. It's fine. But uh, again, thank you for joining the show. This is huge. I mean, uh, you're, you're our first official Star Wars- uh, actor guest we, we've talked to some some extras that worked on mandalorian we've talked to some uh you know fan artists but you are the first actual star wars actor that has participated in the live action movies worked with lucas worked with the cast so uh this is huge for us so again thank you for giving us uh, a bit of your time this evening over there in the uk absolutely my privilege and my pleasure thank you for having me and uh, hello all right, we, we we got a few people in the live stream. We we'll, we'll have a, a few thousand more on the podcast platform. So, uh, the way we we kind of like to to start our interviews here, Silas, is to establish our guests, kind of their 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 Star Wars biography. Uh, now, I mean, you being one that has actually played in Star Wars, obviously, you know you're you're at the top. But uh, I just like to kind of let our fans know, or or kind of just get inside the guest mind and and how they. Uh, thought about Star Wars maybe before, in your case, working in it? Uh, is it something that, you know, per se, it, has Star Wars always been something that you've been a fan of? Or did you kind of fall into the job and then become a fan of it once you started working mm -hmm. in the universe? Okay, so this is a funny story. Uh, some people out there may have heard me say this before. Um, but, and this is absolutely true. I knew nothing about Star Wars before I <laughs> before I stepped onto the set. Absolutely nothing. It's a very, very strange thing. So I grew up in a very quiet coastal town. That's where I went to school uh, from the age of four until I was 18 in the 70s, you know. Uh, and Star Wars, of course, came out. But I wasn't really somebody. I, I was at a public school, so I was working very hard. I wasn't somebody who went to the cinema or the theatre. We had one cinema in town. We had one theatre. And um, I just didn't go to the movies often. In fact, I didn't go to the theatre. I can't remember any seeing anything as a child. And then I just happened to go on stage at the age of 17 in a school musical, and that's what started me acting. I was like, wow, this is fun. I'm going to do this, uh, which is another, another story. Um, and then I ended up at drama school in the kind of early 80s. And I started to go to see movies that were relevant to what I was studying. So I started to watch a lot of Kurosawa and Kislovsky. And, you know, then I started to get into going to the cinema a lot. But somehow, Star Wars just passed me by. Even with George's Kurosawa influences, you didn't, did, did you see any of that in, in Star Wars after you watched those films? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a very interesting story I'll come to in a little bit about about exactly okay. that. Um, so I'm 30, 31 by the time I get a, um, a call from Robin Gerland, who at the time was George Lucas's personal assistant, and she was also casting the movies. And uh, my agent called me up and said, uh, so... They're making the Star Wars films. And I went, what? what? They're making the Star Wars films? But they already made them. And he was just like, oh, God, Silas, uh -oh. no. No, no, no. What they're doing is they're making three new ones, prequels. And I went, oh, okay. Okay, cool. He said, you know about them, right? And I said, well, of course, I've heard about them, but I've never seen them. And he was like, okay. 
well, you know, do a little research. I have you this interview. So I went to meet Robin Gerland. There was a very small part as a pilot. I think it was like maybe a couple of scenes or something, or one scene, um, which never made the cut. But my agent had Miranda Richardson, uh, who had met George, and there was a connection there. So he said, look, I got you this meeting as well on the back of him meeting Miranda. Please go and speak to you know Robin Gerland. So I go and have this interview with her. And at the time, there was really no script to play around with. George was playing with the idea, but she just wanted to meet a bunch of people. When about was this, Silas, like 94, 95 or 96, maybe? Uh, 95, I think. Gosh, it's a long time ago now. I can't remember exactly. It's 95, 96. But it was, it was very, they were close to film. Okay. Okay. Uh, they, they had all their major people on board and now they were, you know, kind of like, trying to find people for all the little parts. And, and so I go and, I go and have an interview with, with uh, Robin and we're in a hotel room in Soho and she puts the camera on me and she said to me, so you know all about Star Wars? And I went, well, actually, I don't. <laughs> Oops. I was just so, well, no, I was just, I was being right. honest, but I was so cool because I knew nothing about it. You know, I, I knew nothing about how huge this world was. You know, I just heard people talking about it. She went, are you, are you kidding me? And I was like, no, I really, I know nothing about it. I've not seen the movies. I've heard about them. You know, I've seen some of the little toys that people have, but it, it kind of passed me by. And she went, oh, okay. So we started talking about all kinds of other things, you know. And, um, and then she, this was the time before smoking indoors was banned. And she took <laughs> out a packet of cigarettes and she started to light her cigarette and she said, oh, would you like one? And I went, no, no, thanks. I'm, I'm good. I, I don't smoke. And she went, oh, and she put the cigarette back in her packet. And I said, what are you doing? She goes, well, I'm not going to smoke in front of you. And I was like, oh, man, that's so American. I'm totally, <laughs> yeah, I'm totally cool with it. So here she was faced with this guy who seemingly just didn't seem to know anything right. or seemed to care what's going on. You know, she showed this interview to George and apparently George said, I like him. I like him. And the reason is, I found out later, is that, you know, everybody who got an interview was dying to be on Star Wars. Yeah, they were all like really pumped right. for it. And I was like, meh, you know. So, so do you, I mean, <laughs> so, do you think that that ultimately helped you then? Was was your lack of knowledge, he, he might have looked at you as someone more of a, like a blank slate and, and you weren't coming in with any preconceived ideas of what it was to be in Star Wars. Yeah, I, I mean, you'd have to ask George if that was the case or not. He did laugh about it with me. He, you know, he did say, "I love you." I loved your interview <laughs> at the very. Beginning. Is that you know, out there anywhere? Did a, that make it on any of the behind the scenes? You're, you, no, 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 no. They wouldn't. They would never show. You know, uh, a, a, an audition interview like that. That's that's kind of you know private stuff. But but uh, I I like to think that it probably did simply because you know people are surrounded i mean george is surrounded by people who absolutely love this world and love these movies you know and i think it was probably just fresh for him to have somebody who was you know who knew nothing about it but i was totally game for it as well you know when robin took me into the creatures department she said you know when i went in for a little meeting about this tiny pilot which didn't make the the cut and then they offered me lieutenant williams and then i was walking around the, the building and Robin was showing me around. She showed me to the creatures department and I saw this bust of what would become Kiadi Mundi. And I was like, Oh my God, that's so beautiful. What is that? Who's that going to be? And she told me, and I said, Oh, that's incredible. What a, what a beautiful piece of work. She said to me, have you ever done any prosthetic work? And I said, no, never in my life. You know, she kind of went, would you maybe like to, you know? Yeah. Like, Hey, this I guy said, doesn't yeah, know what, what the process is like sitting in the chair for five hours. Let's sign him up. Right. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, you know, the thing is, guys, I'm up for anything in my profession. I will, I, you know, I'll try anything. Working with prosthetics on or doing voiceovers or doing silly voices or, you know, being on stage or doing uh, an online piece of theater or whatever it is, I'll go with what's new there and fun. So I was up for it. But I think, yeah, it probably did help that I knew nothing about Star Wars. I think it was probably fresh. Was, I, I do think yeah. I remember seeing that when I was doing some research about the the initial role you went up for. Now, did your agent get the call? Was it was it just kind of like a general call, or did someone did Robin 
see some of your reels and be like, hey, we we want to we want Silas to come in to audition for something. Uh, I don't know about what went on behind scenes, actually. You know, sometimes uh, people call up my agent and say, I'm interested in Silas Watts' availability. Sometimes my agent will will suggest me and then they might, you know, say, yeah, let's meet him. Or they may say, send us some show reels, send us some of his material. I never ask questions about how okay. things came yeah, about. Yeah. You know, people sometimes tell me down the line, but as far as I'm concerned, my work starts when I go into the meeting yeah, room. Yeah. You know, I'll do my research on, on, on people and find out who they are. But how they found out who I am, I no it, it was meant to be, right? It was the force doing its work. That, that's how we like to say <laughs> yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, it very much feels like that because it was one of the most fortuitous things I've ever done. And, it, you know, and then to answer the, you know, the question that you originally asked, yes, it opened, up, it opened me up to a whole new world. I was like, wow. I went to see all three movies because they, they released the, um, the limited edition of all three movies for the first time. Just before right, yeah, we started in the mid nineties, I remember that. Yep, that's right. So I went along to this cinema. Very few cinemas here were showing all three in a row, and I went along to them. And you know, there I was in the cinema. I didn't, I didn't know what I was going to expect. And then <laughs> over my head, I was like, "Oh my god!" And even though this film was, you know, decades old by then, I could see why it had such an effect on yeah. people. Even then, decades later, it still, and it still does now, you still sit back and go, whoa, even though people have, you know, been doing things like that, and George has opened up a whole new world, it still oh, hits yeah. you. Oh, yeah. So, uh, are and you yeah, a fan now? To, are you a Star Wars fan these days? Yeah, yeah, I'm a fan now, yeah. Well, I'm a fan now. I think they're amazing movies, and I think what George has done is incredible, and the whole world of storytelling is amazing. But yes, I did straight away. I, was, I could see the influences, you know. That's what George was so amazing at doing, was pulling in all of these other influences that we all kind of knew about and making them into something that was yeah, And just how he would shoot the films. I mean, I, I know Kathleen and, and even John Favreau, they, they've kind of credited the whole volume technology and using those LED stages now. Uh, to George and what George wanted to do, the technology just wasn't quite ready when you, when you all were making the prequels. That's why you had those huge blue screen rooms, green screen rooms. You, 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 you as actors really had to, to earn your money on the prequels in uh, imagining some of these scenes that you were in. Sure. Sure. I mean, you know, the first thing to say is that I think that's what George is brilliant at is the technology. You know, he's a, he's a pioneer of movie-making technology. And I think that's his real strength. There are other um, directors who kind of, you know, grew up with him and, you know, they went to the same film school together and knew each other who have gone in slightly different directions. So, you know, you've got Steven Spielberg, who's a kind of, you know, all-round filmmaker. Francis Ford Coppola is a very specific kind of, you know, uh, director, story, story writer. George, you know, has written his great stories and made his great movies. But actually, for me, the innovation of George is the technology. Yeah. You know, what he's done with, with the technology, how he's pushed the boundaries and, and constantly re-kind of, you know, evaluated the way in which we can make oh, movies. Yeah. And, and experience. Just, I mean, THX, ILM, all that has, has stemmed out of his side projects just to make yeah. his movies. So. And it's amazing how many movies you watch now and you, and you see, you know, THX coming up or Lucas Sounds or, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. I guess it's, it's, it's quite incredible how influential he has been. Ha have now. you kept up on, I guess, what it's been branded now as, as Disney Star Wars? Have you watched any of their um, projects, Mandalorian, any of the movies? Yes. Or? yes, I have done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen, I've seen a couple of them and I really, really like, you know, what they're doing. Um, there, there is a, for me, there's a there's a point at which a franchise then becomes its own kind of thing, you know. Um, it's 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 still groundbreaking. It's still storytelling. You know, it's just that universe being stretched, and I think it's wonderful that it's been passed on. You know, because when George passed it on, we were like, "How's it going to work out?" Right. You know, how's it going to work out? But J.J. Abrahams and and the other guys, they've just you know 
they have put their own stamp on it and it's a whole wonderful world now it hasn't lost anything did, did you send any flyers their way when you heard that they were making more movies you try to get them to resurrect uh, moon d or, or gun ray somehow uh, <laughs> i did they know where i am <laughs> <laughs> yeah right well they, they did find you for uh I, I believe you you did uh key's voice in season seven of the clone wars right that's right. Yeah, was, was that kind of a surprise call? I mean, because they, they, I don't believe they used yeah. you for the Clone Wars the the, the first couple seasons, uh, but yeah. then they, they did loop you in for the final season, which we all thought was awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was great. No, it was a total surprise to me. Total surprise to me. And it's just always, I mean, you know, it's been twenty odd years now. It's just always lovely to you know to go back in some form or other into the booth and. And recreate that stuff. He just—he always yeah. said he has a, such a distinct voice, which obviously is is your voice. And uh, I, I was doing some reading that you, you kind of based the, the voice off of like an, an old person, right? I mean, someone that spoke more thoughtfully, more carefully because of their wisdom yeah. from and age. It really, exactly. It really came down to that design, you know. When I, I saw the. Um, uh, the clay head that they were modeling Kiardi on. And then when I saw them do a kind of uh, a mock-up of what would become the, the foam head, uh, I just, it, this is before he was painted, you know, I could just see this very wise old man. To me, he looks like um, kind of like a, a Native American spirit or, you know, somebody who's been in a ashram in India for years and years and years, meditating, contemplating. Oh, yeah. So somebody who's very centered, you know, he's just got that look about him. And of course, with the with the two brains, you just assume him to be exceptionally wise. So when people are like that, they don't they never have to raise their voices, you know, and they speak with a very centered voice. But he looks like a, you know, an old wise soul. So in I kind of focus on that. In terms of building that persona, um, did they kind of give you a little bit of, you know, leeway to to build the voice and, and build the character the way that you saw fit, as you described? Or did they kind of go in after the, the character creation and give you some details on like, oh, this is where he's from. This is his his background a little bit. Yeah, not with Kiadi, not okay. with Kiadi, because, you know, the thing about Kiadi is that uh, what I was doing on set was recorded because the the prosthetics prosthetic foam only, only came to around here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, the mouth is painted, but it's my mouth and what I'm saying on set um, in real time was recorded as such. And so I just, you know, went in and adapted that or adopted that voice, used that voice. George didn't say anything. He said, we love what you're doing, you know. Awesome. With Newt Gunray, it's different. Because with Newt, they played around with, you know, how do we want the Nemoidians to sound as a group of people? And then they plummeted for a particular kind of an accent, which I know there's a whole, there's a whole story around what that accent is, but actually it's much more simple than, than people thought. Um, and then we talked about different, you know, actors, different kinds of voices, you know, and we, the, the three of us, there was George, me, and Robin, in a voice booth in Abbey Road Studios, oh which was so for me. I, I'll tell you about that. Were, were, were you able so to bring any souvenirs back from the studio? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> just, 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 uh, just happy yeah. memories. The, the three of us worked on that voice together, and we all came up with you know a, 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 a sound that we thought would 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 work. But yeah, Abbey Road Studios, man. I mean, you know, as an Englishman uh, going into Abbey Road uh, Studios and being able to work could, in could there. Could you feel not... like their spirits there? Like, I mean, just the amount of, <laughs> of rock and rollers that went through that studio. I mean, I, I would think that it's like oozed into the walls and paint at this point in time. Like so, like their mantra just, just oozes out. Totally, man. And I believe that about buildings. Like, you know, buildings are living things and they imbue um, energy. So, you know, like when you go into a house that, people are happy and you go, this has got a lovely atmosphere to it, this house. And you can go into another house, you know, and the energy is not good. And that's contained in walls and it's contained in materials. If you go into a church, you know, even if you're not a religious person, you go into a church, there's something wonderful about true, true. not just the cool air and the incense, but 
it's it holds the atmosphere of so many people meditating on life. It's got a particular calming atmosphere. You go into Abbey Road Studios, man, it just has this extraordinary atmosphere. Did, did you feel like pop, singing? I mean, did you, did you break out in song at all? Did you, did you catch yourself yeah, on the yeah, instruments? Yeah. <laughs> you do all the time, yeah. You want to go and see these little rooms where people recorded. Right. And so we're in the middle of doing this recording, the voice stuff for Newt. It took about, I think it was about four or five days doing the whole thing. And, um, and at one point, lunchtime, George says to me, um, John Williams is downstairs. Oh, my with goodness. The <laughs> would, you, would you like to just, you know, pop in and have a listen? I'm like, John Williams is downstairs. <laughs> Recording, he went, yeah, 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 let's go and have a listen. So oh. I go in there and it, the, the, the whole kind of, you know, the, 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 the room where they put the philharmonics, you know, and, and there's the whole orchestra and he's playing and recording it, it was just wild Unbelievable. it was totally it, it, it really is amazing some of the experiences you got to go on because of of this role and i, I mean other celebrities they get it too if you listen to interviews you know this musician saw this musician they sat around one night and someone did back you know backing vocals on their track we might have never known of it just it, it's crazy the opportunities that open up when you get involved with Star Wars, yeah. working with George. Uh, back to the Newt stuff, because, I mean, me personally, yeah. I love Newt. I think he's one yeah. of the best villains. He, he's very, like, Saturday uh, Flash gordon serial type of sci-fi yeah. villain, like a, a, a Tommy yeah, Tough yeah, guy that really can't back anything up that he says. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, that's yeah, why yeah. I love him. So, so the and I always, I always find myself like, What's going on down there? And uh, is can we make it legal like that? I just I love the accent. So where did you pull that from then? Like, were you listening to other dialects? I mean, did, did George say we want yeah. to sound? Well, George George chose the accent. I mean, basically, the accent it came down to um, a Taiwanese accent. Lots of people thought that it was Japanese, okay. and they were making some commentary about you know trade federations and so on and so forth. But that's just not true at all. It was very, very simple. They, had re they went around, they recorded lots of different actors saying a few lines from around the world. And then they, what they wanted to do was try and pick a sound, an accent that kind of worked with how the creature looked. And the Nemoidians have no noses. And there's something about that he recorded, I think, three or four Thai actors. And there's just the way in which they speak. We all have different we, we resonate at different parts of our of, of our face and our body so the american accent for for example is a very nasal accent you guys are really like up here and and <laughs> and we're much more down in the throat we resonate here in the throat the thai accent also resonates up in the in the nasal cavities but it kind of sounds like it's slightly blocked and they, he recorded these three actors, and it sounded like they were kind of quite nasal but blocked, like you know, like their kind of noses were blocked. And he thought that sounded quite good with the fact that the Nemoidians had no noses, and that's as simple as it gets. After that, we played around with various different kinds of um, – we thought of different actors, and, and I – I, I landed upon Peter Lorre, who was, you know, a kind of classic um, actor who is, it was American, but originally, I think, was from Hungary. And he had this very sort of um, uh, obsequious way of sort of doing his evil characters. You know? <laughs> so I brought that kind of element into it because... Newt Gunray is nothing if not obsequious. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's no hero. No. You know, he's a slum. Oh, yeah. yeah. You, you pull all these elements in together, and, and that's how we, you know, we came up with the voice. But also the physicality of it, the kind of... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that sort yeah, of physicality. Sniveling, groveling at times. Very slimy. Yeah. yeah. And all of that was determined by the look of him, really. Now, I, I'm assuming you probably delivered your lines on set in the prosthetics... And was it, that was an animatronic face, right? Did, did someone have yeah. to actually move the mouth as you were acting out your scenes? Yeah, it was crazy. Like, <laughs> throughout the three movies, the whole technology of the animatronics completely changed. 
and it was amazing to see uh, again as we were saying about george you know he's a he's a technological innovator and everybody who's working around him they're not only using this new technology they built they're rebuilding it as they go along and so it was with the animatronics so at the beginning they had this extraordinary kind of you know, motorized mouth with these pins that came through and as the pins move around they they moved the the very soft um, prosthetic of his mouth and it was hard from here around so on the first movie the phantom menace i had a little microphone inside I had a little earpiece so i could hear better what the other guys were saying on set um and as i spoke <laughs> the guys across from me like you know they would be behind cameras maybe like five yards away had these little remote things like you know, like, like like you're playing playstation you know? and they were oh, trying yeah. to move them like this and they had learned the lines as well so they're trying to make the right you know the right sound so when i go Murr, they go the lips go Murr, as opposed to you know <laughs> and it was just it was crazy you know so it, it didn't work all that well there's a lot of like funny lip syncing. did you do any adr for that then or yeah they took it live from the totally. set you couldn't hear anything okay. you know like mm -hmm. it was just coming out muffled so then we adr'd the whole thing then the second one what they did was they managed to synthesize the um the lips so that if you made a recording then the the pins could move oh, okay. the lips according okay. to the recording that's so then incredible. we would have somebody else speak and I had pre-recorded the lines. They would just play the line. So I'm just in the thing where I was going, nee. <laughs> that also didn't really work very much. By the third time, what they had managed to do was get the technology so that you have a little microphone inside and the lips move as you're speaking. And they have learned, the, ca the computers learned all of the different sounds wow. and all the movements that could go with that different sounds. Wow. Amazing. And, and to put that into yeah. perspective, that, that was probably what a, a six year time frame they went from having to use remote controls to it literally learning what Silas was saying and, and translating it to the mouth movements. Yeah. yeah. Insane. It was amazing. Insane. Insane. I'm s but we were watching this, you know, throughout the whole process. I mean, the green screens, the monitors, everything was, was, was changing around us, you know, and just getting better and better and better. And they had more and more. They're just boys with toys. Right. They had more and more gadgets to play with. These did, guys. did you like Amazing. that as an actor, where you, you essentially had to come in and everything was different between each movie, or would you prefer to just have a repetitive routine and process? I loved it. <laughs> I love all of that stuff. I love the innovation of it. You know, yep. it, um, I'm just constantly amazed by how creative people are and how it's much people want to play with stuff. You know. It's probably one of the few times in your acting career or anybody's where you, you got to see technological advances happen in real time throughout a three movie stretch. Because if you think about it, you know, current movies now, they, they still have some changes, but George was literally building technology that people would be using for decades after all in, in one shot. So that had to be a pretty special experience. Yeah, it is. It is quite amazing to to see that. I mean, that side of it is 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 not my job. You know, my job is something else, and my job constantly adapts to what's going on around. But you know, like I said, I love that kind of stuff. I love the adaptation on it. It's very different working in that way than going and working on stage or doing a little bit of storytelling in a forest or you know doing an animation or a video game voiceover or something like. That. There's loads of different formats and media that we play with as actors. But just to watch these guys to, you know, and I'm, I was always asking questions, what does this do? And what does that do? And when you press that, what happens? And, you know. Did they ever let you play I, with the remote controls to move your character's face around? <laughs> or, or were they like, yeah, no, yeah, this yeah. costs too much money, don't break it? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, a, a bit of one and a bit of the other, actually. <laughs> you know, sometimes they're like, yeah, play around with this thing. It's something like, you're never allowed to go near this. <laughs> gotcha. Do you have any Newt Gunray heads sitting in your home right now? Did I don't have anything that i could have taken away no from props the not even your lightsaber you didn't even bring back key oh uh, okay all right are you kidding me <laughs> they didn't take anything i've told this story about the, the whole lightsaber handle because they designed different handles for each of us you know 
and um, and it was so funny because we would we would film fights and stuff with a handle with a, a, a stick coming out of it that had a green you know like green screen around it so that you could do all the movements and you could actually fight each other and you knew where you were fighting and then they would just green screen that out and you know CGI the 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 the, the lightsaber right. on it but there were times when we're just sitting with our lightsabers you know on our belts and then the, the props master would come along and I kid you not it was like this beautiful sort of oak box that they had made for the hand for the lightsaber hand and they would they would come along and they would open up you know and I was allowed to take it off me and put it onto my costume <laughs> every time we finished a, a, a take you know or perhaps if there wasn't much time in between takes we would finish a scene they would come along with the box and they'd go like put it back in <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like the Fort Knox <laughs> yeah it's, it's like the money guy <laughs> yeah. Go put it in the safe. Yeah, come yeah, to yeah, lock yeah. him down for the night. I have a feeling Ewan McGregor that, probably lifted one off a set. I don't know. I'm sure Ewan McGregor li- lifted <laughs> loads of stuff off. <laughs> you never know I'm about that guy. Of, yeah. Of Ewan McGregor's terrible <laughs> <laughs> uh, propensity to be a thief. Uh, that's, 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 that I can't possibly comment. <laughs> it's a size. You, you trained at at the drama center. If if I if I got yeah. my research correct, so. Exactly. Did, did you envision yeah. being more of a, a a theater actor, or did you always want to do screen, or even you know the the voice work that you do? I mean, what what was your initial like when like you said you're at seventeen, you kind of got the acting bug via high school or, or doing a, a play uh, at school, and then you went into it. Uh, did you want to be a stage actor, or were you like, hey, I'll I'll do whatever, whatever pays the bills? Yeah, uh, I, I, of course I wanted to do uh, whatever. Um, I love working in theatre. I also love working in TV and, and film. You know, I, I've loved everything that I do. I don't really have a preference. At the end of the day, uh, there are certain choices that you make based on your lifestyle. You know, like you can't be doing theatre all of your life because it doesn't pay that well. You can't be doing uh, movies all of the time because you don't get to be at home you can't be doing television series all of the time because, you know, uh, over a long period of time, that's extremely hard work and you need a bit of a break from that medium. And on film and TV, you don't get the rehearsal time to build as you do in a theater. So you make your choices depending on what it is that you kind of want in your, in your life right now. But all of the media I wanted to play around with, I wanted to find out about, Um, Like I said earlier on, I'm interested in all different forms of storytelling. Right. So I'll go with anything that's there. My one criterion is that the script is good and that the story is worth telling and it's something that I feel that I would like to do. So I don't tell things that, you know, the only choice I'll make, uh, I'll say no to is if I don't particularly want to work with that script. For Star Wars, then, were you given a script, or was it more like, "Hey, Star Wars is interested, Silas, go and go and audition"? Uh, I, I was given a, a script initially to uh, consider, you know, Kiadi and Newt, and uh, and I read it. But again, you know, you, you're not going to go wrong with George, and you're not going to go wrong with this franchise. Right. Uh, there was lots of changes made. A lot of it was kind of, you know, um, making the choice in good faith. But when you're when you have to have faith in a person like George Lucas, it's it's easy. When when you, know. when you got the nod, you get the call, or I don't know, maybe it was live there with Robin and George. What yeah. what was that feeling like? I mean, were you just floored? Was your mind blown? Were you calling people like, "Hey, I just I just booked Star Wars. I booked the new Star Wars." Or were you like, hey, you know, well, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I, I deserve this. Yeah, and- yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, <laughs> Well, I don't want to burst your bubble around this, but, you know, because I, I, I recognize that it's a huge world for people and it's an you know, amazing thing to think of being in something like that. But at the end of the day, it's my job, you know, and uh, and when the, when the decision comes like, through you know when when the offer comes through i'm always excited about work that i'm doing but it's not like it blows my mind you know my my first thought is right i've got to get on and do some work now right you know so when i go into a room and i have worked with some 
amazing people. I've been extremely privileged to work with some legendary people in my career. But at the end of the day, you don't go into the room thinking, oh, my God, I'm in a room with George Lucas or I'm in a room with, uh, you know, um, Christopher Lee or I worked recently, I did a TV series a few years ago with Donald Sutherland. You don't go in there going, oh, oh my God, it's Donald Sutherland. You go in and go, you know, this is the right. guy that I'm working. These are the people that I'm working with. And we're all here as a family. We've all come together to create this story. And, you know, I have a part in this. Uh, I have a, I, I have a say in all of this if I'm going to be part of the whole process. So you see each other as equals straight away. Okay. And, of course, you're happy when the job comes along. But this part of your brain just clicks into, right, next thing is got to get this job got done it, with these guys. It's a good job. You know. yeah. it is, would, would you say, looking back on it, and, and obviously you still have a long career ahead of you, but would, do you consider it one of your top gigs, one of your career highlights doing the Star Wars prequels? Uh, yeah, of course. I, of course. And it just opened up a whole other world to me that I knew nothing about, you know. And yeah, having said what I just said, it is really cool when you go on set and you go, there's Sam Jackson, there's Liam Neeson, you know, and um, and just meeting all these guys who are at the top of their game, you know, of course that was, it was, it was just something else. Have you, and it was, have you, it's amazing what it's opened up to me. Have you stayed in touch with any, uh, any of the cast mates, any of the cast members or even... Uh, some of the crew from from your Star Wars days, or I know you you all probably go your different ways and different projects. But did you maintain any any friendships from your your Star Wars work? Yeah, I, yes, I did for a while. I mean, you know, the the thing about our profession is that you become very very close to people. You know, you you're you're a creative family for a while, um, but you are together for a short amount of time in your life, and there are lots of these families that you build. So what tends to happen is that you become good friends with people. For a while, you can't contain all of those people in your day-to-day life. So those friendships become great memories. And then every once in a while, you might work with somebody again, you know, and then that that sparks up. But yeah, for a number of years, I maintained, you know, uh, a, a good few friendships. And I still see people on the circuit, which is lovely. You know, that part of it is great. We're always catching up with each other. Yeah, yeah. And I have you have that that shared people. history, so it, it probably is like seeing long last friends or a college buddy or even someone you, you knew and mm-hmm. uh, when you were kids. I could imagine once you get around it's each exactly. other, all those memories come back and, and the conversations just start flowing. Yeah, exactly. And you remember all those great times you had on set, and you do pinch yourself still and go like, "Did we do that? We did that, didn't we? We actually did that." So, yeah, you know, I made some good friendships. Um, I'm not in touch with absolutely everybody that I was, but we, we see each other still every once in a while. All right. Yeah. So, you, you know, you go from horse opera, which was your first big, big time <laughs> project, right? And I think in 93 and then six years later, you're, you're starring in, in a star Wars film. So that, that's a hell of a trajectory. Uh, but did, did you know you were going to get multiple roles when you auditioned for star Wars? I, no. No, right? It was no, going no, for the pilot, no. and that got scrapped. And- yeah, yeah. I went up for this for this pilot scene, and then, uh, and then, you know, shortly afterwards, they came back. Robin phoned up and said, "Look, that that pilot is no longer there, but there are a couple of other little roles. But it, at the moment, George is wanting to recreate this scene, and he needs some some actors to recreate the scene as they're building how they're going to okay. work the camera." Okay. Work. Uh, and it was the scene where um, uh, Jar Jar and Qui Gon and um, the, the three of them go down into—I can't remember the name of the waters now. They they dive down into this into this deep water, and they need to recreate that or plan that. So the three of us went in, and Robin called me and said, "Would you be happy to come and do this for a couple of days?" I was like, "I'd love to." And whilst I was there, that's when she showed me around oh, the okay. creature department. And on the second day, George came to me and said, listen, you know, there's, a, there's this little pilot scene. You know, it's, it's not quite as big as what we were looking at beforehand. It's just a few lines and stuff. But I'd love you to come and do that for a day. Brona Gallagher is going to be doing it as well. I love Brona Gallagher. It's like, I'd love to do that. And then Robin showed me the creature department. And I said to her, what's this? And she said, Ki Adi Madi, and... As I said, she's like, have you ever done prosthetic work? And I went, 
no, I'm not. You know, would you like sign to? me up? Great. Yeah. So then we did a prosthetics test to see, you know, like if I could work with it, if I was claustrophobic or not. Uh, we did that. We started to play around with some of the um, uh, the kind of the storylines of Kiadi, and you know, do a few kind of like screen tests around that. And then I said to her rather cheekily, "I don't really want to do prosthetics work unless I get to do the voice as well." And she said, "Well, your voice will already be heard in your face character, which is Lieutenant Williams." And I was like, "Yeah, but you should listen to my voice tape because I've got a very versatile voice." And she went. Okay. Um, I was actually going to ask, did, do you feel like you, you, you kind of earned those roles due to your voice work and, and the ability to create yeah. different characters through your voice? Yeah, totally. Uh, you know, there's a different kind of ownership. I think when you're playing the whole character, you're voicing it as well, rather than just being in it. There's a different kind of ownership. And I was quite determined about the ownership when uh, Robin also asked me. So I was already doing Kiadi. And she said, would you be interested in, in being inside one of the Nemoidians? And I said, I, not unless I can do the voice. And she was like, come on, <laughs> Sila. <laughs> I was like, Robin, you could, you've heard how versatile I am. Let's play around with some accents and stuff, which we did. And then she played the, the recordings of me messing about to George. And George was like, he can do this. Let's just get him to do yeah. it because he knows these characters. That's how I ended up, you know, I was, I was pretty pushy about that. I really wanted to to play the whole of the character, yeah. not just be inside it while somebody else voiced it. So some know. of it was circumstantial, like, hey, we need someone to stand in, but but a lot of it was just you, you know, promoting yourself, selling your skill set, putting yourself out there, like, hey, I can do this for you all if you give me the chance. So I hope, I hope people are listening to this. Yeah. I mean, once you get your foot in the door, shoot for the stars, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, what's the worst that can happen? They just say, they say right. no. Right. Then you're in exactly the same position you are right now. And, and look where it got you. It got you four roles. Two of them, I, I, I'd yeah. say, are quite major roles. I mean, they're, they're characters that are still yeah. discussed to this day in, in Kiati and yeah. Newt. So, And I get to be in a scene where I'm talking to myself. Yes. True. <laughs> <laughs> you got to like that. I just I, I have thoughts of the end of WandaVision right now with, and I don't want to spoil yeah. it for anyone, but Paul Bettany <laughs> essentially doing something very similar. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Out of your roles, yeah. I mean, I, I guess let's just stick to the two main ones. What one did you consider the most difficult to play? And that, that could be from any angle, wearing the costume, the, the physical aspect, yeah. the, the, the accent. Yeah, I would say that it was it was Newt, actually, because um, because that costume and, and the headset was very, very uncomfortable. You know, Kiadi it was a long time in makeup, the four and a half hours to get all of that on and an hour and a half to take it off. So they were long days, you know, when you're traveling to set and you're doing a 12 hour day on set, you know, uh, I was, I was coasting on like three to four hours sleep a night yeah. whilst I was doing that, but it's okay being tired. You know, um, I got to just sit and meditate in the in that chair while they put the makeup on. But when I was on set, you know, that stuff was incredibly light. The whole head was incredibly light. It almost felt by the end of the day like I didn't even have it on. So, you know, it was comfortable working. Whereas with Newt, you know, this was like a a motorized motorbike helmet <laughs> going over my head. You know, like just oh, over my whole face. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. Slits with all these wires and this whirring and noise and could you, you know. even breathe? I mean, whether there were like, was there an air tube, uh, a water tube? I mean, you, you guys must have seen those pictures of them feeding us air. You know, we got yeah. those those tubes, and every once in a while, between takes, they put the rubber tubes in to give us air. And you know, as soon as they took it away, we probably had about ten to twelve minutes, maybe twenty minutes, at an absolute push of comfort to be able to work after that you start to get giddy with the bad air yeah just it would, it would affect the performance too much so they had to give you had to yeah. give you breathers uh, un unbelievable yeah, it, uh, and a heavy backpack and a very heavy costume so and george was great you know he would shoot things and coordinate things so that we were just in these things for about 20 minutes and then we'd have a a little break and come back to it but that was hard work that was hard work so yeah. i i know you're a, you're a taller gentleman so with with Key's yeah. head piece strapped on that had to be hitting what over seven feet. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, totally. like, people six... have to watch you so you weren't hitting hitting doors and whatnot. I, or... I was constantly walking into doors. <laughs> like I said, I just forget that it's yeah. there. And of course, it didn't hurt because it was just it was rubber, but it would just start to pull in our yeah, probably you know? mess up mess up the makeup a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. They were always having to touch it up. Always walking into stuff. But yeah, that would have. I'm six foot four. That was probably a good eight or nine inches. Jeez, on that, so. yeah, that had to be. I, I would imagine during like the the stunt choreography, did you have to account for that thing whipping around, or because it was so light, you it just felt natural as part of your body and. It's, yeah, totally. I mean, it's the lightest thing. It's just, you know, like basically that in, inside is just two balls of foam. And then they built the foam around that and it would slip over my head. It was shaped perfectly to sit on my head, slip over. And the first pieces would glue down to there and then down to there. And then there were separate pieces to do the rest of the face. So it glue that bit on and it just, it didn't feel like I had anything on my head. Light as air amazing technology and your skin can breathe through that stuff so they glue it on and it doesn't feel uncomfortable you yeah know, I, it's I figured just, it'd almost be like wearing band-aids or something the way you, you rip it off and you get all irritated and you, you like you said your skin can't breathe through it but it doesn't sound that was the case so yeah no 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 it was it was very very comfortable uh yeah then it would take a while to get it off and it, it would sting a little bit because they've got this glue all over it so they had to put the solvent in between just to get the glue off. So it would take time, but it was very comfortable. So yeah, always banging into stuff. <laughs> For you personally, is there is there one prequel scene in particular that, that stands out to you? Either one you were in or just one from the three movies that you're like, I'm really proud of our team for what we did here in this in this scene. Uh, I think it's the fights, actually. I mean, it was amazing to, you know, to to bring Ray Park in. Ah. See, see double lightsabers, and you know, see those fights. That did you um, were, were you on set when they filmed? Let's just say the Phantom Menace when when Ray was there and they filmed the big uh, Naboo fight. Did did you get to watch any of I, that on set? I I came in. Oh to watch yeah. It, yeah, how great was that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just it was it was incredible. I mean, those guys did an amazing job, and and they worked really hard. I mean, you know, Ray is already a really, really good martial arts um, practitioner by then. But what Ewan had to learn, you know, I mean, he worked really hard. It was, you know, I was just, it was just great to watch those guys working. Really. Yeah, I, I, I could, I could see that being a perk working on Star Wars and uh, on days like that or scenes like that coming in. And uh, I, I don't know if yeah. you stuck around when, when Hayden donned the Vader suit in Revenge of the Sith to, to watch him walk out on set and that. I know he had just wasted your character a few scenes before that, but it, you know what I mean? <laughs> Watch, watching those scenes play out in real time and not watching the yeah. finished product had to be something else. Yeah, yeah, exactly. How, yeah. how, was, how was filming your, your death scene? You know, Ki-Adi Mundi's death scene at the end? Because like... If you if you watch those movies at the end, you get so attached to the Jedi characters. And I know us as fans, you know, we watch it and we see Kiati die and it like it hits us. Was there a moment for you where it's like, oh man, like this character that I built and put so much into, this is the time that that he's over now? Um I don't think about that. I don't think about this the time that it's over. Um you just and as I said earlier, you get on, you do your job. You got you know, you I never really spend time thinking this is the last scene or this is the last time I'll be on this set. Okay. I can spend thinking, you know, time thinking about what needs to happen here. And, uh, you know, Nick Gillard was our amazing fight coordinator. And Nick knew that I had a theater background and uh, he came up to me and he said, have you ever done any kind of, you know, combat like this before? And I went, the only thing I've really done um, is I've done some sword fighting on, on stage. And that's different because, of course, it's mostly single-handed. And everybody else is using their lightsaber with, you know, with two hands. And he said, well, what are you comfortable with? And I went, if we, if we can do some single-handed stuff, you know, that would be great. And it would be different. And he said, yeah, I mean, what's it, you know, show me some moves that you've got and just show me some attack moves and some defensive moves. And he said, okay, we don't need to, you know, impose too much upon you here. He said, you move very naturally. So what I want you to do 
is just go out there and have some fun. <laughs> George came up to me and he said, <laughs> just, I want you to imagine that there's bullets okay, coming at you. Every yeah. And he said, all I want you to do is, you know, just do a whole load of attacks and a whole load of defenses and think about people coming from different angles. And I was like, do you need to, me to pinpoint particular places where these guys are going to be? <laughs> and he went, nah. He said, you just do your stuff, <laughs> have fun, just know where the camera is. And he said, we will paint everything in there afterwards. You go. Like, <laughs> yeah. Wow, you can do that? And he said, we can do anything, Silas. So, you know, <laughs> it was, I was just basically in this massive room with a green screen and me just going down, down, down. <laughs> just, That's great. Just this crazy stuff. I was going to ask what it was like working with George and if he ever, you know, personally directed you. So I'm glad you, you brought up that moment, yeah. but that, it sounds very uh, similar to how I, I've heard other cast members talk about George's directing, which is very minimal. Uh, yeah. Just, he, I, I don't know. I, 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 the way I've heard other actors talk about, it, I think some actors would prefer more, more direction from a director where others may prefer how, how George seemingly does it, where, like you said, he's like, Hey George, what do you want me to do? He's like, just go out and have a good time and swing it around and, and we'll fill in, we'll, we'll paint in the CGI. Uh, did you, did you yeah. like his, his approach to directing? Well, I mean, uh, you, as far as I'm concerned, you recognize that different directors on different kinds of um, projects have different jobs. So with something like Star Wars, you're working with somebody who is working mostly with the technology and, you know, and the actors too. Whereas if you go into a rehearsal room in a theater, those directors are working only with the actors in the room. And then afterwards they might have production meetings, but they're not dealing with all these other people. So you have to recognize that people have lots of different things to be doing. So if George is not paying attention to something that I might want to pay attention to, like, you know, I might want to improvise a scene, he might say, I don't have time for that. We've got to pull all these other elements in as well. So then at that point, you know, whoever you're dealing with, you have to adapt to the way in which they're working. So there's always this kind of compromise between how you like to work and how other people like to work. You find the bit in the middle. And this is true of anywhere in life, isn't it? We all have different right. techniques of how we go about working. And you have to recognize that, you know, depending on what people's different techniques are, their different approaches, their different perspectives, but also what their, what their needs are, you have to adapt to all of that. I never found it a problem. I, you know, whatever I had to ask George something about the script or the character direction or, you know, the kind of the story arc of the character or some backstory that, that you know, meant something to me, he was very, very approachable. Okay. He may not have brought that stuff up himself. Did he, did did you know? um I guess did he ever get into nerdy conversations with you where he he may over explain a scene or was he usually just to the point left it pretty wide open and let you actors do your thing? Yeah, he was very he was very to the point. Um, you know, he um uh he gave us a lot of leeway, which I particularly like. I mean, he trusted that we were we were doing our jobs and we were going to do our jobs properly. And then, you know, he would tweak things or change things a little bit. But, you know, more often than not, he's like, show me something, bring me something, you know. And I love working in that way because then it gives you scope. You know, like, for instance, the way in which I characterized Kiadi, he said nothing about it other than I love what you're doing. Just carry on with that. Thank you. Did yeah. he give you freedom with the dialogue too, or was it you had to stick to the script? Stick to the script. Okay. No, no change yeah, in the was, words. No, sometimes I might suggest something. You, you know, you always do. Uh, you know, if if you feel that um, if you feel that something isn't quite working, your insider character didn't quite make sense to you. But that world is very specific. You know, it's not like working with a writer in, in theater where you're, you're creating a world you all don't quite know yet. George's world is very, very specific. You know, so he was a little bit more, right. you know, he was just, a, 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 he wanted us to be a bit more attuned to what he was writing, but that wasn't to say that he was inflexible. It's just that it was already there, really, and it's, you know, it's a kind of part of, a, 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 of something that he's already worked out. Thanks. Well, Sias, I know we're coming up on our hour, so I, I don't want to, to push you uh, beyond that, but I have, I have one more question if you'd be willing to answer. 
Um, I guess, do you personally have any just memorable moments from working on Star Wars that every once in a while you might just reflect on, maybe up at night drinking a glass of wine, having a beer, and just sitting there and be like, man, that was a blast back then in, in the 90s or the early 2000s. Like, I, I'm going to go yeah. watch Phantom Menace right now just because of that feeling. <laughs> I mean, do you, do you have a memorable <laughs> moment from from your experience working on the Star Wars movies? Yeah, there were I mean, so many memorable moments. You know, one of the loveliest things for me was being in Australia, working in Australia for, for two movies. And that was like, a, and we were all there together, away from home. So it was, you know, it was like a paid holiday, really. Um, but for me, the most memorable thing was right at the beginning of The Phantom Menace, when Yoda was still being um, uh, puppeteered, manipulated is the proper word, uh, by Frank Oz on set, you know, before they started to CGI right. him. That was magical because, you know, um, when I was a kid, here's a story. I've shared this before. Uh, when I was a kid, the Muppets, I, I was so into the Muppets. The Muppets were huge, you know, and um, <laughs> my paternal grandmother, very Edwardian lady, she was very proper, um, she would come to visit us, but she wouldn't often spend that much time with us kids. You know, she kind of, um, she preferred to, she was quite a quiet lady, you know, and she was quite proper and she, she didn't want loads of noisy kids running around the place. <laughs> you know, we loved her very much, but I'm well with that. But we would sit down in front of the television every time the Muppets came on, she and I, and she absolutely loved the Muppets. And so did I. So I remember just sitting, you know, curled up next to my grandma watching the Muppets together. And it was the only, like, you know, really intimate part of our relationship. Everything else was quite prescribed. But that time that we had together was really special to me. And it was the time when it was just me and her. Nobody else was particularly interested in them in, in yeah. the house. She and I spent, you know, with this very kind of intimate time together. So there I am on The Phantom Menace. And, um, and they bring in their puppet of Yoda. And, and I'm, you know, just wondering, where is he? And, of course, they built the set up so that Frank can be underneath. Frank was doing the head and I think the left hand, and he had a young puppet, puppeteer in, a, a woman whose name I forget now, but she was so excited to be working with him because he of would course. have been one of her heroes. Yeah. yeah, doing the right hand. And, of course, you know, he's mic'd up underneath the stage and that voice starts up. <laughs> And I'm doing this scene and I'm sitting right next to Yoda, you know, right. I've got Sam Jackson on, on this side of me and I've got Yoda on this side and I'm talking to Liam Neeson. <laughs> and, uh, wow. Yeah. It's just incredible. And, and the voice starts off, Frank's voice starts off and I'm just like, ah, oh. I was thrown right back to those days. So, um, and of course I had all my prosthetics on, which I never came out of until the end of the day. So quite a few people didn't actually get to meet, or see me as I look, you know, and Frank and I, we were just, you know, on a tea break and we're kind of chatting away. And, and, uh, he said to me, hi in there, I can't see what you look like. Uh, I know your name's Silas. I'm Frank. And I went, yeah, I know you're Frank, you know? And he said, um, I'm kind of really intrigued to see what you'll look like after this. And I went, well, you'll have to wait till we finish shooting. And a, and a, a couple of hours after that, till like, I'm out of this. I said, have you got a photograph of yourself? I went, no, but we're on set together tomorrow. I'll bring you one. So I bring him a photograph of myself. And he went, you know, he was kind of joking. And, and I brought him on. He went, oh, my God. Oh, that, that's, you did. Uh, he said, oh, my God, you're so handsome. <laughs> I would, I would, thank you very much, Frank. Because, you know, so we kind of warmed to each other. And I, and I just said to him, I don't often do this. I said, you know, I work with all kinds of people all the time. And it can be a little bit, you know, um, cheeky to, to kind of say to people that you're a big hero of mine but i wanted to tell the story of me and my grandmother watching the muppets oh. together i told him the story and, he, and i said so thank you because you're responsible for bringing you know this right. wonderful little intimacy in the shared cultural moment into into the relationship with me and my grandmother and he just was like that is such a lovely story i want to spend time with you when you don't have all your prosthetics on can we go for lunch sometime? Oh, boy. <laughs> Look at this. I was like, I'd love to. So the next time he said, well, listen, I'm on set 
in a couple of days' time. He said, you're not on the schedule, but if you come in then, we can, we can have lunch together. You know, uh, you can come up to my dressing room and we'll have lunch together. And, and so we did. And I remember just spending like an hour and a half talking to him, you know. And that, to me, that was really magical because I was sharing something intimate from my past with a legend right. who I happened to be working on set with. You know, that was... No, that, that's that's really, fantastic. That very, what, what a story. Yeah. It, it's like I say, you just, once you get an opportunity like that, you truly do not know where it is going to take you or who you're going to exactly. meet or what you're going to be getting into. And, and that was just a, a yeah. fantastic little anecdote. So, And it's a, it's a nice little circle to bring us back to the beginning because the story at the beginning was like, you know, so were you a big fan of Star Wars before this? And no. I was like, I didn't think Star Wars, but the Muppets. Yeah. <laughs> hey, <laughs> Muppets and Star Wars kind of go hand in hand. And, you know, Mark Mark Hamill worked with the Muppets. So, you know, they're, they're not too far off in terms of franchises. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. All right, Silas. Uh, again, I, I can't thank you enough for for giving us an hour of your time. I know it, it's getting late over there, so we do want to let you go. You, you, you've said it all. You told us some great tales. Uh, I, I know currently you're, you're doing some voice work on a video game, Squadron Forty Two. Is there anything else we could let people people know to check out that you're involved with? Uh, just over here at the moment, I did a uh, a, a TV show uh, before Christmas, and I've just finished performing an online theater piece, which was extraordinary, really. Like, you know, we're talking about innovation at the moment, how people are writing little plays. I did a two-man play, which uh, are performed and filmed, live-streamed on my phone. Wow. It was a phone conversation with somebody else, you know. Um, so just stuff that's homegrown at the moment, that's over here. Um, you know, things have been quiet during this whole period. Things are starting to pick up at the moment. So... There's a lot of auditioning and, um, you know, right now there's, there's nothing international happening for me, just a few homegrown projects, but things are starting to pick up. Yeah, so. we, we have, we actually have a pretty decent following over there in the UK. So uh, you never yeah. know. We're, we're here for you. We, we, we've got a contact. So if you ever have anything you want us to share or write about, we'd be more than happy to help out. Yeah. Bless you. I will do. Thank you very much indeed. So, yeah. Thanks again, Silas. It, it was awesome talking with you. Uh, again, I just, just appreciate it. Like I said, a huge, huge fan of yours. Love the characters you've created in Star Wars. And uh, again, thank you for talking thanks. to our, tea, or, or, our fans. Much appreciated. Not at all. It's a, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's a lovely way to do things because at the moment, you know, I can't meet any of the fans. You know, the, the conventions aren't happening. Hopefully, touch wood soon all of that will start to come back but for the meantime you know look after yourselves yeah. everybody and it's been a great way to be able to reach out and say we're all still here i'm looking forward to seeing you again soon thank you sir have a good night appreciate you it's, bless you take good care look after See you yourself. now thank take you silas bye. bye all right ladies and gentlemen how was that that was fun. That was fun. What did you think about that? That was pretty fucking cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Silas was awesome. So he was just so fun to talk to. The stories that he told were incredible um, and really gave you insight into the production and the making of those movies. I mean, it doesn't seem like uh, it, it seemed like it was a very fun experience. And for, for people like us who are just, you know, fans, we only see it from the exterior right. to have somebody who did play pivotal roles in these movies, you know, uh, Newt, Newt Gunray is essentially positioned to you in, in, in episode one as, Hey, look, this is what you can expect from the villains in this movie. It's the first bad guy you yeah. encounter. I mean, he was responsible for it all. He was, he was Sidious's yeah. kind of the, the, the linchpin to get his plan and acted uh i know newt's yeah. kind of a dingbat but that's why i love him and wow that was just i'm kind of shaking a little bit you know i, I was yeah. nervously anxious to do the interview <laughs> uh but afterwards i'm just i'm kind of riding a high uh, riding a high right now i can't yeah. even talk like that was just fucking great <laughs> it was it was incredible and it, you know uh, to have somebody like Silas come on here and give us an hour of his time and tell us the stories and be as <laughs> magnanimous like... and as, as friendly as he was, was really incredible. You got so, to 